Father, thank you so much. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. morning. Welcome to our second service this morning here at Brian Bible Church, and also welcome to those who are following us on live streaming. Uh, we're so glad that you could be with us this morning. Before we return, 
uh, to our worship, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, this evening at uh, 6.30, we'll be right back here in the auditorium. If you haven't been out to Sunday night services, we have a great time of fellowship there, and we're studying in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, tonight, we're looking at the relationship of David and Jonathan, and uh, actually, uh, you know, a lot of uh, parallels to today because David's getting to that point uh, where all of the props have been taken from him, all, all the things that held him up, and he's going to go uh, fleeing, actually, from Saul, and he's going to be out in the wilderness for like 10 years, and uh, imagine that, and certainly, I know a lot of you feel like you've been abandoned uh, right now with what's going on in the world, but uh, you join us and uh, come out and see what goes on there. As far as in your bulletins, I don't want to read them all to you. I just want to highlight a few. Uh, we do need help in the twos and threes. Uh, just the first Sunday of the month, maybe you want to uh, help out one Sunday a month with the twos and threes. They're great. They're fun. And uh, if you're interested in that, uh, there are people there to contact in the bulletin, Betsy or Scott or Amy or Kevin and Sue, or just even one of the pastors will get that, uh, those things out to you. Uh, there's a new ladies' Bible study that's beginning on Tuesday. They do it in the morning, 9.30 a.m. or at 7 p.m. There's actually even child care provided for the evening study. It's going to be a study in the book of Ruth. If you have uh, questions about that or want to sign up, you can do that in the back with Kelly Lynch. Uh, also, oh, it's been postponed. I was like, don't I know what date it is? Okay, it's been postponed. Okay, it's been pushed back a week, so now you even have more time. All right, that's great. So it'll be the 19th then, right? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Lifted Up Ministries, which is uh, a ministry I'm on the board of, and uh, it's uh, not part of Brian Bible Church, but very closely associated with working with people coming out of uh, poverty situations or drug addictions or, you know, needing homes, needing... Uh, help getting back on their feet. We have some people that we're working with, and we need people to mentor them. Uh, and if you want to get involved in a person's life, as a, you can just be friend. You can be an accountability partner. You can uh, share with them a lot of spiritual truths and even the gospel. Uh, you can contact Priscilla Brown. That contact information is in the uh, bulletin. You can see me. I can uh, hook you up with that as well. And then also, next weekend is the ladies' retreat over at uh, Camp Sankinac. And uh, if you're interested in that, uh, there's still, I think, time to sign up for that. If you have questions about it, you can see one of us after the service as well. Uh, now, just as I was thinking about going back uh, into our time of worship this morning, my mind was drawn to Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2, where it says, It's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Isn't it great that we have an opportunity to worship to praise, to give thanks to the one true God in all of the universe. We get to worship him. We get to, as it says in verse 2 there, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We have a God who stands beside us, who upholds us and uplifts us every single moment of every single day. Amen? And so you're going to sing and praise him now, right? Okay, Josh, lead us in that. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? I like that. That's good. Uh, so my name's Josh, for those of you who don't know. I'm filling in for Nick, uh, as he wasn't able to be here with us this morning. Um, but with that, please all stand up and get ready to sing some worship this morning. We're going to start with Great Are You, Lord. It's your breath, 
Next song is going to be Take My Life and Let It Be. Take my Take 
Morning. Our scripture is found in Luke chapter 8, and we'll be reading verses 4 through 10. Again, that's Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 10. And while a loud, large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And his disciples asked him, what this parable meant. And he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. And uh, Pastor Jeff will expound upon that passage in a little bit. Uh, for now, let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we do thank you for just another day that you've given to us, another day to sing your praises, Lord, to sing of your glory, of your sovereignty. Lord, we thank you so much for being able to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning and worship you. Lord, we pray that uh, we would remember, Lord, why it is we sing, why it is we worship. Lord, you are deserving of all honor and glory and praise. Lord, I pray that as your message goes forth this morning, that you would just use Pastor Jeff in a great and mighty way, that he would be your mouthpiece this morning to challenge the hearts of those listening. Lord, that as we hear your word, may we be not just hearers, but doers. Lord, may we put into practice what we hear and apply to our lives the things that we learn. Lord, so great are the truths, Lord, that are contained in your word to us. Lord, we're so thankful for scripture and the promises contained in it. Lord, we marvel at your word and how timeless it is. Lord, how applicable it is even today in 2021 as it was thousands of years ago. Lord, uh, I just pray now that uh, again you would open our hearts to what you would have each one of us learn. And Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and give you all the honor and glory. In your precious name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. All right, so this next song we're going to be singing is the song of the month. If you guys are new here, every month at Marine, we like, to, we like to pick a song and sing that every single week just to help everyone kind of learn a new song. Um, I didn't know this was going to be the song that we were doing until it was uh, a Friday. Um, but one thing that I did um, kind of realize as I was reading over the words of this song, um, I was, uh, it kind of took me back to when I was in Montana. Um, I was working at a Bible camp out there and I became pretty good friends with a pastor out there, um, and one thing that he told me has always stuck with me um, from that moment until now, um, and I'm sure it will probably the rest of my life as well, um, but the one thing that he consistently would always say was that the gospel is not just for new believers, um, and he was utterly convinced of this, and he, he lived his life by that. Um, every single conversation that he would have with someone... Um, you know, that was a believer, he would still bring up the gospel with him. Um, and it was super encouraging for me to see that. Um, and the, the one thing he kept going back to was, you need to preach the gospel to yourself every day. Um, because that's like one of the single most greatest things in existence. Um, and so why would we just use that as like an entrance into Christianity and then forget about it? Um, so as we sing this next song, My King Forever, I just want you guys to have that in the back of your mind. Um, but you all can stand with us, and we'll start singing it.
gave your life for mine. Nailed to the cross, you crucified all my sin and shame. It was washed by your mercy. You are the treasure I This next song is Build My Life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. so much for this opportunity to be able to come together um, just as a body of believers with all this crazy stuff that's going on in the world right now. I uh, just thank you so much just for that gift to be able to gather together. Uh, God, I just pray that you would just keep us all safe, and uh, Lord, I just pray that you will just be with Jeff this morning. Um, as he brings your word, I pray that you would just speak through him, um, and I just pray that you would be with us all, help us all to be able to listen attentively as well. Thank you so much for everything you do for us in my pray. Amen. All right, we'd like to uh, say a special uh, word of thanks to the, uh, the Bo Jean Band this morning. There were three of them up there. Uh, probably, uh, you know, you don't always know what goes on behind the scenes here, but, uh, you know, with Nick being down this week, uh, I guess, uh, you know, Josh got the call, you know, somewhere, you know, toward, uh, toward the middle of the week. He was in Florida without his guitar, 
Uh, so I got home at 8.30 last night, turned it around, uh, you know, learned the songs, and I uh, was up there leading us this morning, so thank you guys. Let's give a nice little round of applause for, uh, you know, stepping in and helping us out this morning. You know, God always provides, you know, what we need. Amen? Amen. All right, let's uh, uh, start the message this morning. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles, Luke chapter 8. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the parallel account in Matthew chapter 13. So we'll be sort of flip-flopping between those two passages in a message entitled, Dirt. Uh, and uh, so we're going to look at, uh, we're gonna look at some pictures, uh, you know, here, you I mean, on the screen for you in just a minute. You know, pictures are really incredible things. Think about the, the power that is in the ability to capture a single moment in time. I mean, that's really what the wonder of a picture is. How, how amazing is that? You can capture a moment. Then you can look back on that moment, you mean, over and over and over again and think about how amazing, you mean, that was or what happened at that time or what was I feeling or thinking or what was the mood. I mean, people love pictures. I should say most people love pictures. In fact, we've got a younger generation that is just, uh, you know, obsessed with pictures. In fact, we've got the word selfie that is now, you know, coming to our vocabulary because of the, the picture-taking nature, I mean, of our younger generations and the advent of cell phones. Now, I don't know what it is, but I think people sometimes today are totally overboard with pictures. I mean, why do I need to see every meal you're eating, you know, posted up a picture of on social media? And why do I need to see a picture of everywhere you go, of every experience you have, of every friend you're with? I mean, of every mundane thing in life. I mean, I, like, pictures are out of control. Now, I knew this a long time ago. Because oftentimes, we would go, you mean, on uh, youth retreats. We did, I mean, quite a few of them. In fact, this was the season. I think the youth group's about ready to take off. Ladies are going next week. Men have already had their retreat. Uh, we take the kids away for, you know, four days. We did this throughout the last 30 years. Uh, and, um, you know, you go through the weekend, and you mean, and they were great fun. Uh, you mean, I guess see a picture up here, you mean, you know, of that. Uh, and, uh, you, know, we'd, uh, you know, we'd have all these kids, you mean, away with us. Uh, and, um, you know, you're grueling it out with games and carrying on. You mean, over four days. By the time you get to the end of the trip, you're just absolutely exhausted. You're hammered. You mean, you're ready to go home. You know, especially as I got a little bit older, I got to confess, man, it got harder and harder to whip up the energy, you know, like, come on, kids, let's do it. You know, like, it's like, wow, okay, after a while, it's starting to get harder and harder. So you're toward the end, your patience is fried, and the very last thing before you jump in the vans is the good old, what, group picture that we have to get every year, right? Well, I mean, you know, it was simple. You know, you all get in there, we take one picture, we're out of there, right? Oh, but, now, but as the years went on, now we need to have 25 pictures because everyone needs their own cell phone to picture, their own cell phone with a picture. It's like, and it got so out of control. It's like, oh, the pictures, it's ridiculous. But you know, when I look back at old pictures, like the one you see here, I got to confess, they're bittersweet moments for me. You know, as I look up there and I, and I see all those faces, and, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And some, you mean, of those, of those kids, I mean, that, that you see are, are, are here in this room, you know, this morning. Some of those kids that are in the pictures, I mean, of those, this one and, you know, the many others for years and years and years, I've lost track of. Some of the kids that have sat in youth group, you mean, over the years, I mean, have gone on, you mean, to walk with the Lord and are still serving Him faithfully today. And growing in their faith. Some have walked away. Some have left the church entirely and don't come out at all anymore. Some of those kids, you mean, in the pictures, you mean, that I see their faces, you mean, uh, you know, they're, some of those kids have gone on to be missionaries. And they're serving the Lord out there in the, in the front lines. And some kids have left youth group and gone on and become hardcore atheists. God-hating people. And I find my mind haunted at times by their faces. And I think to myself, you know, despite all of the love, you mean, and, and the teaching I mean, that we poured into them, and yet to see, you know, so many, you know, walk away, you know, from church, walk away from the message of the gospel, walk away from the deep fellowship and the bond that existed, you mean, in youth group and in church. I often get to thinking, you know, what did I do wrong? Was there some way in which I failed them, some, some teaching that I failed to give them, some preparation that I failed to make? You know, and I'm not alone in that. In a sense, all of us experience that to some degree. And maybe for you, it's not, you know, youth group kids, but maybe it's your own children. 
Maybe it's your grandchildren. Maybe it's a mother or a father. Maybe it's a coworker or dearly loved friend or distant relative. But we all, you know, know people like this, people that know the truth of the gospel, that have heard it from you, that heard it from me. People that have, you know, grown up in the church. They've had the word of God scattered, the seed scattered all over them, and yet, I mean, they've walked away. Yet while the kid sitting right next to them grew and became this incredible saint of God, and sometimes there appears to be no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes the one that I thought would go on to do great things for God, you mean you washed out, and the other that I never would have expected, God grabbed a hold of their life and transformed them, and I'm like, I, I, I have... How do we explain so many different people that have heard and yet not responded in the way that we expected to the message? It's easy to think that maybe the fault lies with us. And Satan can easily come and bring discouragement to us because of the lack of response that we see in some people when we scatter the seed. But yet, it is the parable of the sower that reveals the truth to us. The parable of the sower is what sets us straight, and we're going to look at that I mean, a little bit here this morning. Now, again, we always need to set, uh, I mean, our, te our text of uh, Scripture in the right context. And so remember that Jesus' fame is increasing. And as his fame is increasing, as people are, are, are getting to know him more and more, as people are coming from every town to be able to listen to him, he's transformed the area, he's doing miracles, he's proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. And as well as his fame growing, so also is growing his opposition. And more and more people are turning away from him. And the Jewish religious leaders of the day are rejecting in, in an outward way and are looking for ways to plot, building a case against him that will ultimately lead to his crucifixion. And so as this opposition has reached, you mean, a very, a very high height, I mean, Jesus changes his ministry strategy and he begins to teach the people in parables. And this is the first of the parables that we encounter in the Gospel of Luke. And it's the parable of the sower. Now, better it should probably be known as the parable of the soils, because it's more about the soils than the sower. In fact, many of the parables are misnamed. We call it the, par the parable of the prodigal son. Well, it's really not so much about the, the prodigal son, but about the gracious, loving father, right? And so here we stand at the, at the verge of this first, you know, uh, first parable I mean, in Scripture. And so we need to talk a little bit about parables themselves uh, I mean, before we actually, uh, you know, dig a little bit further into the text. What is a parable? At the onset here, you know, we need to get our, our definition straight. How many people have heard this one? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Okay. Now, again, I'm not here to slam that. That's a perfectly good explanation of what a parable is. A bit simplistic because you learned it in fifth grade. Uh, you know, but, um, but it does a good job of explaining a parable, right? It is that. It's an earthly story that Jesus puts alongside a heavenly truth. So in a very real way, that's true. Now, why did Jesus teach in parables? People also ask you that. Why this change in strategy, Jesus? His disciples are going to question that in just a minute. Well, I mean, a lot of people will say that Jesus taught in parables to help people understand difficult spiritual truths. Now, is that true? Yes, it is. That is one of the reasons why Jesus taught in parables. But the truth, the full truth of why he taught in parables is a little deeper than that. We're going to look now at Matthew's parallel account. It's a little bit larger, a little bit more expanded, and it's going to give us the answer as to why Jesus completely and truly taught, you mean, in parables. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. Then his disciples came to him and asked, and by the way, this is after he gives the, uh, the first part of the parable, because remember he gives the parable and the interpretation, right? They come to Jesus and they ask him, why do you speak to the people in parables? Now, his reply, these are some of the toughest verses in the New Testament to understand. You know, he, he, you know, he says, he replied to them, verse 11, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Okay, wait, what? Wait, wait a minute here. Time out. 
What's he saying here? What is the deal with this? I mean, this is why I'm teaching in parables. Jesus is telling his disciples. They ask him. He's telling them plainly because the knowledge of the secrets of heaven have been given to them, have been given to you, but not to them. Okay, this needs a little bit of explanation. First of all, let's look at a couple of the terms here that he uses. First of all, I mean, we want to look at the word secrets here, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have the secrets of the knowledge of the kingdom of God that we possess right now. That's pretty interesting. That word secrets is the Greek word mysterion. We get the English word mystery from that. Its meaning is this, something that's hidden or something that's veiled. Something that has previously not been revealed. That's uh, the idea of the secrets. I mean, that we possess the secrets of the kingdom of God. Jesus uses this language because the first century audience, influenced by Greek culture, would have certainly understood the idea of a secret or a hidden knowledge that only a few people know or understand. Because in the ancient world, there were all kinds of mystery cults. All of the gods and the goddesses, I mean, in Greek and Roman culture, they all had these mystery cult religions where they would go out and find disciples and bring them in as initiates. And they would give them a certain amount of knowledge and always tell them that, like, hey, there's more to come. Sort of like, you know, modern-day Mormons or Scientology. By the way, if you're into Scientology, you can skip to the end. By the way, it's aliens. That's, that's the end. I mean, if you ever watch some of those programs, creepy stuff, man. And so what they would do is they would bring a person in to say the cult of, of Isis and Osiris. I mean, and, uh, and uh, using the story, you I mean, of, this, uh, of these Egyptian gods. This is one example. Let me show you how this would go. They would talk to you about the wisdom of Osiris and worshiping Osiris. And they would give you a little bit of knowledge. And then as you progressed along your discipleship, they would give you more and more, reveal more secrets. And they would tell you that there are more secrets yet to come. And then one day they would sit you in front of a drama that would be played out by actors. And they would tell the story I mean, of Osiris, this great king. I mean, who was a great ruler over his people and who did people all kinds of good. And how uh, Seth, his brother, was so jealous of him. And so one night, Seth sneaks into Osiris' bedchamber, takes a measurement of his body, height and width and depth, and he builds an elaborate sarcophagus, an elaborate, very expensive coffin, and he brings it out at a party, I mean, that was going to be happening in a few days, where all the nobility of Egypt were gathered. And he says to all the rich nobility, hey, I mean, anyone that can fit inside this coffin, I will give it to you. And one by one, all the nobility tried to fit inside, but it didn't fit, I mean, any of them. And then at the end of the night, they said to the king, to Osiris, maybe you should try. And so he gets inside the box. It fits him perfectly. And when he does, Seth and all of his uh, conspirators, about 70 of them, slam the lid of the box closed. And they lock it. And they throw it into the Nile River, causing the death of Osiris. But Isis, Osiris' wife, is so uh, you know, distraught and such a loyal, you know, loving wife that she goes and she finds the coffin, I mean, the next morning. And she takes the body out and begins to lovingly prepare it for burial. And Seth catches word that she went out to look for the, for the body, and so she hides it in the grass, and, and, and Seth finds the body. And she cuts the body up, and he cuts the body up into pieces, and throws it into the river. But so loyal is Isis' love that she comes back later, and finds all of those pieces, and lovingly knits them, and sews them back together again, and through powerful magic, Isis is reborn in resurrection. And so you can imagine how moving that would be for someone sitting there and watching this play, you know, being borne out by actors, and you're finally in this, you know, you're given that, that last bit of secret knowledge. That's the, the idea here, I mean, that's in the mind, I mean, of the hearers, I mean, of Jesus teaching here, the disciples. That the mysterion, that the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, those two words are synonymous, have been given to you. Now, let's look at for a minute. The idea of the, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. What is that? Well, basically, it's the rule of the Messiah over the earth. That's a simple definition. That's exactly, you know, what we, you know, what we understand, you mean, even to this day. That the earth is the Lord's, and what? And everything in it. We know that God's the ruler over all the universe, right? And we know, you mean, that uh, he gave that kingdom, you mean, to mankind to be able to administrate for him in the Garden of Eden. But man lost that because of sin. And now Satan, the usurper, has come in. I mean, he was taken, taken, wrestled temporary control of this earth. And one day, Messiah was going to come. And that Messiah was going to bring the kingdom of God on earth again. Right? And eventually, you know, we're going to get to the eternal state where, you know, things are back the way that they should have been all along. Only better. That's the story of the scriptures. 
Think about the idea of the kingdom of God. I mean, we saw this, you mean, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament predicted that the kingdom of God would come, that the kingdom of God would come on earth when the Messiah came on earth, right? The two were linked. So all of the Old Testament pointed toward this great moment when the Messiah would be born. And when John the Baptist, the forerunner for the Messiah, goes out into the wilderness and he's teaching, what does he say? He says, repent, folks, because the kingdom of God is what? Is at hand, it's near. Because the king of the kingdom is here. And there's the king standing in their midst, demonstrating his authority, his power, his royal nature by all of the miracles that he did, by the wonderful words and the preaching that he, that he, that he, that he conducted, I mean, that he taught people with. And there are many people who are sitting there with the kingdom, the truths of the kingdom of God being taught to them, and yet they are rejecting them and seeking to try to find a way to kill him. The very Jewish leaders who should have heralded him as Messiah and rejoiced in the coming of the king. But those disciples, oh, but you guys, you're different. To you, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given. You know, we possess that knowledge. Think for a minute about what an unbeliever would say if he came into our church in the middle of a communion service. And he sees all these people even in his communion service, you know, moved to tears with a little piece of nasty, you know, you know, you know, styrofoam, you know, you know, whatever that stuff is we got now. And that gross, you know, juice that tastes a little bit like formaldehyde. Not that I know what formaldehyde tastes like, but I digress. You know, and, and, and we're being moved to tears over eating a little bread and drinking a little juice. People go, what's going on here? They don't understand. But to us who understand that these elements represent the body and the blood of Jesus that he gave for me to save me from my sin, it takes on incredible meaning. That's something we understand that the unbelieving word will never understand. They don't get it. They don't understand that. It's hidden from them. It's a mystery to them. See? That's what Jesus is saying, that the secrets of the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God will be given to you, but not to them. Folks, we belong to the kingdom of God. Now, given, you mean, the, the state of affairs, you mean, in the country over this last week, you know, I've gotten a lot of texts, I've gotten a lot of, uh, uh, you know, things given to me, you know, you know, videos, you know, emails, there's a lot of talk about there about all kinds of things that could possibly happen in the next week. I mean, that uh, through the storming of the Capitol building, this is the pale horse of revelation that, you know, the Lord's coming back tomorrow. Folks, let me tell you something. I hope, he, I hope he does. Yo, let's try that again. We need an amen on that. I hope he does, right? I mean, that would be great. But you know what? I can tell you this for sure, and I can prove this to you from the scriptures, that the Lord's coming in the rapture of the church is about five days closer than it was on Tuesday. That's what I can tell you for sure. His coming is imminent. It's always been imminent. You know, all kinds of Christians now are getting a little worried. They're getting a little scared. They're going, oh, this, this has to be. You know, hey, maybe, but we don't know that. But what we need to understand is this. That even if things get bad, I mean, in our country. That even if we you know we're all on the crazy train now, and I mean, the heat starts to get turned up on Christians, guess what? You know, we're only going to join the rest of the world. We're only going to join the rest of history. Because the freedom that we've enjoyed in this country... The absolute, you mean, the abundance of which we've lived is an abomina is an is anomaly, anomaly in all of history. Yeah, wrong word. Never before been seen. Most of the history of the church has been persecution. Think about how many Christians were killed under the Roman Empire Nero, Nero and, other, and other emperors. Think about how many you know, Christians are being killed today in predominantly Muslim countries. Think about being a member even of the underground church in China. I'll tell you what, better one day under a democratic administration than one day, you mean, in, in an Islamic country living with the fear of literal death every day. You know, I don't know how bad, you know, things, you know, will get, you mean, you know, here, you mean, in the country for believers. I can't tell you that. I can't predict the future. But I know this, that maybe God will bring something wonderful out of that, that there will be a purification of the church. That the great church of God who names the name of Christ will wake up and get serious about their faith and serious about the Lord's soon return and get out there and start doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's sowing seed. 
And I'll tell you what, folks, as you sit here today, I hope that your hope is not in America. I hope that your hope was not in President Trump. You know, President Trump was not the savior of America. America already has a savior, and his name is Jesus. And he's the only savior we need. Our hope is not in governments. It's not in constitutions. It's in a living savior. We're not of this world anymore, folks. This world is not our home. As nice as it is, as much as we love this land, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus. Let's look back again at verse 12. He says this, Jesus goes on to say this, Whoever has will be given more, and they will have in abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they think, I added that, they have, will be taken from them. Now, that's an interesting verse. What? Again, you know, what are we talking about here? This is, this is, this is kind of interesting. It's like Robin Hood in reverse, right? Instead of, you know, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, you know, we're taking from the rich and giving it back to the richer. What does he mean by this? Well, think about it for a second. Think about the Jewish people. The Jewish leaders that are sitting there listening to Jesus' words. Think about all the truth that they had been given in the prophets. I mean, they had Moses. And they had Abraham. And they had David. And they had Isaiah. I mean, and they had Ezekiel. I mean, they had all of the prophets. They had all this information. They had all the truths of God to be descend upon them. They had all the predictions of the Messiah. They had all of the stuff that pointed toward the king. And there he is in front of them. And they reject him. And they harden their hearts. And they close their eyes. But the disciples, they saw. Their hearts were humble. And the secrets of the kingdom of heaven came to them. And not only would we be given that, but they'd be given much more. Look at the state of the Jewish people even today. They have a dead religion that offers no hope at all. There are Jewish people with no temple, with no sacrifices, with no priesthood, and with no way of cleansing sin other than just be a good person. Guess what? The whole Old Testament tells you that ain't happening. And to those that were given so much Yet they rejected even what they have has been taken away from them. Wow. This is pretty interesting. A lot different than what you thought, right? Those parables are a lot more complicated, right? This is a, some deep truths in the Word of God, right? You see, what Jesus is, is preparing his disciples for is that listen, there's going to be some rejection that's going to come to you as sowers of seed, right? Verse 13, check it out. This is why I speak to them in parables. And here's going to spell it out. Though seeing, they do not see. And here he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. What? I'm teaching them in parables so they don't understand? What, what is he talking about? Get this. If you don't get anything else this morning, why did Jesus, Jesus teach in parables? This is the reason. The parables of Jesus reveal truth to the one with an open heart. But conceal truth from the one with a hardened heart. That's why Jesus taught in parables. If you had an open heart to hear and to understand and to seek God and to seek the truth of the kingdom, then the parable would open your mind and your heart and you would receive more spiritual truth. But if you had already rejected the knowledge that God had already given to you, then the parable concealed truth from you. Because this is true, that the more revelation a person is given, the more they're responsible for it. And so in teaching in parables, Jesus is actually being merciful to those who would reject him by not giving them additional light, additional understanding, additional revelation. Because it's not a matter of the mind. It's a matter of the will of the heart. He goes on in his quotation of Isaiah chapter 6 and this, 
In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become what? Can't hear you. This people's heart has become what? It's become calloused. And they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. That's, that's an act of the will. You notice that? It's an act of the will. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and I would what? What would God do? He would heal and save. But God will not force his salvation upon you. Do you have an open heart to receive it? Similar ideas taught to us in the New Testament, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1 and chapter 2. The words will be on the screen uh, you know, for you here. Verse 18, we read this, For the message of the cross is what? Boy, you got, are you guys half asleep already? You know, I, you know, it hasn't even been like you know, 45 minutes yet, you mean, and already you're asleep. Are you guys there? Are you, 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 you with me right here? For the message of the cross is what? It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Look at, the, look at the dichotomy here. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, that's the gospel, to save those who what? Who believe, whose eyes are open, and whose ears heal. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In chapter 2, verse 6, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden. Notice that word, a mysterion, a mystery that has been hidden and that God designed or destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have what? Have crucified the Lord of glory. They did not want to know that Jesus was the one predicted, was the very Son of God, and they crucified. So great was their rejection. So great was their pride and self-righteousness that they crucified the Son of God. Though who he was was plain to see. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept, notice that word, does not accept, the matter of the will, the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Reminds me of the story that was told of the, uh, of the learned, you know, college professor. You know, so persuasive that, uh, you know, he would start off, you mean, his class, you mean, every, uh, every time by asking if any one of his 18-year-old students, you mean, were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he would find one, and when he did, you know, he would, he would seek to belittle them and, uh, and, and to mock them. And so, you know, one day he asked that question, and the student, you mean, meekly raised his hand, the only one brave enough in the class to, you know, to raise up his hand and, he said, well, you know, you're one of those Christians, right? Yes, I am. You, mean, you believe in Jesus, right? You believe he, he died and was raised again to life. Yeah, you believe the Bible. You believe that? Yeah, I do. Well, let me tell you something. He proceeds to go on in his learned, you mean, your courageous way of intimidating 18-year-olds of how foolish he was and how stupid he was to believe those fairy tales, you mean, and that, and that, uh, and that nonsense, you mean, in the Bible that everyone knows contains so many errors and, uh, and all of it, and you know, how, how often he had read the Bible and found all these things, you know, for himself. You mean, how, how stupid you are for believing in Jesus. And after he was done his tirade, you mean, the student just simply, you know, respectfully said to him, you know, sir, you know, might I say something? Sure, sure, you know, go ahead, kid. Have at it. What are you going to say? 
The student replied, well, I believe that the Bible is God's love letter to his children. And if you've read it, and it makes no sense to you, maybe it's because you've been reading somebody else's mail. Think about that one for a second. You've been reading someone else's mail. Have you had that experience where you shared the gospel with someone? You've made it as plain as you can, and yet still, there's just nothing going on. You know, no, you know, no understanding, you know, you know, no, no, no bowing of the will, humbling of the heart. That's what Jesus is talking about. But look at verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, because they what? Because they see. And your ears, because they hear. For truly... Many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see, and to hear what you hear and did not hear. What a sad commentary on the Jewish leaders of the day, on many of the people of the day, who how Moses and David and Abraham would have longed to have seen Messiah and who sat at his feet and worshipped him and listened to him. Yet here, the Messiah is there, and these people have nothing but calloused hearts, and shut up ears. You see, Jesus is offering his disciples a dose of reality as they go forth to scatter the seeds. The parable identifies for us four types of responses. This is really the key idea here. The parable gives us four types of responses that we can expect when we share God's word with other people. I'm going to put this you know, idea out there. One response which is wicked, two responses which are incomplete, and a fourth response which is good. Okay. Now, we're not going to have time to do all of them. It's a two-part message. We're going to do part two next week. But we want to sort of you know, begin here, you mean, and just introduce me in the, uh, the, first, uh, the first soil here in just a second. Now, as we sort of you know, get to parables, we've got to, we've got to be careful. Because when you interpret parables, there's all kinds of craziness out there. You've got to avoid two extremes when you come to parables. Number one is trying to find a meaning for every little detail in the parable. You don't have to do that. Okay? Uh, that sometimes leads you into all kinds of crazy interpretations. The second problem is oversimplifying it just to one general principle. That's the second problem. You've got to sort of stay in between those two things. Um, this very first parable, Jesus gives, a, gives us a model of how interpretation should be done because he gives us, again, the parable and the interpretation. So we sort of see... How we're to look at parables, I mean, by this first I mean, example. Now, I mean, why the parable of the sower? Uh, and uh, just in looking at the details of it, you got a sower that goes out to sow, and he sows the seed on the path and on the rocky soil, and we're thinking like, hey, is the sower incompetent? Because what sower would go out and sow seed in that kind of ground? Well, remember that a lot of the, uh, the folks, I mean, that were sowing the seed were peasant farmers, and Rome had taken up a lot of the land for their own, uh, for their own use and to sell. Uh, and so a lot of these people, if they were going to eat, they had to go out and, uh, you know, provide for themselves, and so maybe after working in some of the other fields all day, they had to go to the less desirable land and scatter some seeds, and sometimes they were passed, worked their way, you know, through the, uh, through the land, because oftentimes when they were, uh, you know, when they were sowing, they had to travel a distance to get to some of these areas. The, uh, the overall, um, you know, um, uh, terrain in Israel is very rocky, and so when they were sowing seed, uh, you know, many of it fell on all different, you know, kinds, little plots of good soil, uh, you know, little, you know, spots where there were other plants and weeds and spots where there were rocks and there was, not, you know, not a whole lot of, uh, you know, topsoil and, and hard, you know, hard packed paths. So in, in the Old Testament, uh, you mean, the way that, uh, that uh, sowing was done is it preceded plowing. You would go out and scatter the seed and then afterward you would plow. It was done differently than, uh, you know, we would do it today. And so a few things, I mean, the basics of the parable here, I mean, are pretty plain to us. What is the seed in the parable? The seed is very clearly the Word of God, the Scriptures. We have that same seed today, you know, right here. Hopefully you brought it with you. Um, the soils are the hearts of people. And they describe four different types of hearts that the seed falls upon. Four different responses when the Word of God comes. And the sower... Notice the sower that the parable is named for is not identified. Now, wouldn't you think that in the parable of the sower that we know who the sower is? Well, we're not told that. Now, we might say immediately, well, it's Jesus is the sower. And is he the sower? Yes, greatest sower of seed ever, right? 
But it's not just him, it's also you. It's also the disciples. We're sowers of seed. And so this is a parable for his disciples that he gives the interpretation to privately. It's to help them understand the types of responses they can expect, that there's going to be some rejection. And that's where we start. We start out with the first soil, the wicked soil, the wicked response. A farmer went up to sow his seed. He was scattering the seed, and some fell along the path, and it was trampled on, and the birds came and ate it up. Now, let's look at uh, his interpretation of this, you mean, in, uh, in, chapter nine, in, in verse 19, excuse me. Here's, uh, here's what this means. When anyone hears the message, this first soil, these, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this uh, hard-packed path, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed which was sown along the path. Now, a couple of interesting uh, phrases. Actually, we'll just do one here. In the interest of time. The phrase here for, I mean, the, the evil one comes. And by the way, who's the evil one? That's the devil. He doesn't want the word of God going forward, right? doesn't want that, you know, coming to people, right? So, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, the evil one, you mean the devil comes and snatches away what was sown, I mean, in the heart. And that word snatch away, it's a Greek word harpazo. It's the same word for the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians. That will be caught up together, you mean, you know, with Christ, so we'll meet him in the air. Forever we'll be with the Lord. Same idea, same word. By an act of violence, to snatch, grab by an act of violence. That's the, uh, you mean, that's uh, by a powerful act. That's the idea that Satan does this, that he steals, and he comes in and he grabs the word, I mean, out of the heart. Now, notice how it's worded in Luke. That's Matthew's wording. In Luke, uh, you know, in verse 12, uh, Luke 8, it says this, that those along the path are the ones who hear... And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be what? And be saved. The word believe there is a typical word for believe. It's the word pistis. And uh, you mean the word saved there is sozo. You mean to be delivered, to be rescued. It's the, you know, the main you know, salvation word you mean in the scriptures. And so what does this first soil represent? Well, this first soil in a very real way are these Jewish religious leaders. They're the ones that the truth of God had fallen upon. They had all of the truth of God in the Old Testament, the fulfillment of all of the, all of the prophets, the teaching of all of the law. I mean, everything pointed to Jesus. And yet, as the seed comes and falls upon their hearts, their hearts are calloused, their minds are closed, their wills are set against the Lord, and they will not believe. And then Satan comes in and says, thank you very much. I'm going to take that word. You don't need to be contemplating that anymore. And they will not believe and be saved. It's very clear, and there is universal agreement that this first soil represents the unbelieving heart. We know people like this. We've talked to people like this. We've shared the gospel with people like this. And I don't think there is anything more heartbreaking than seeing a person that just simply will not open their heart to the gospel. Now, there are many reasons. Well, you mean, I'm not sure, or you mean, you know, I just oh, I don't want any part of that. You mean, that's nonsense, blah, blah, blah. You mean, whether it's hostility or uncertainty or whatever it is. But, I mean, there's, there's delay and delay and delay, and there's rejection and rejection. And I, I won't believe it. I'm just not going to believe it. I'm not going to make that decision to make Christ my Savior. I've heard the message. I know the message. There are people that grow up in churches. There are people here this morning that are sitting in those seats and they come every week and yet their hearts have never been open to the message of the gospel. I'm just coming because my mom wants me to come, because my dad wants me to come. I'm just here because my wife wants me to come, because my husband wants me to come, because it's an expected thing, because somehow I feel like I'm going to earn some brownie points with God just by showing up to church. Well, remember, being a church no more makes you a Christian than going to McDonald's makes you a happy meal. Always be good to remember that. Does you no good to sit and hear and hear and hear. What's important is response. How to respond to the word that's sown. How to respond to the message of Jesus that comes to us. Again, it's not my message, folks. All I'm doing is, is, is teaching you what he said. That's it. It's here for you to plainly read. 
and the seed comes, there are hearts that close their minds. The will rejects. Now, what do we do? What do we do with people like this? Do we write them off? Do we say, ah, not worth my time. You're out of here. It's fine. No, I don't think that's the appropriate response. I think we should pray. We should pray for these folks. We should pray that God will open their hearts. We should continue to look for opportunities to share the truth of God with them. Because they're headed to an eternity without Christ. And there is nothing worse than that. Maybe you're here this morning. And this soil describes your heart. You've heard the truth many times. It's fallen upon your ears over and over and over again. But you have not made that decision to follow Christ. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm just sharing the truth with you. That you stand on dangerous ground this morning in a state of rejection of the King, the Messiah who came. And that without salvation that he brings, you're headed to an eternity apart from God. That's those four letters. H-E-L-L. -L. That's, that's hell. That's H-E double hockey sticks. That's it. I don't like to talk about that word anymore, but Jesus did more than he did heaven. wonder why. He didn't want people to go there. That's why we sow the seed. Because it's real. Well, that's just for bad people. No, it's for sinners. And I'm one of them. Probably worse than most of them. Maybe you've heard over and over again and still have an unbelieving heart. I would implore you by all the love and the grace of heaven to open your heart, to bow your knee, to humble yourself before the love of Jesus, to receive his grace and his salvation while there is still time. Because that moment when you take your last breath, you mean on this earth. After that moment, it's too late. There's no, oh, well, wait a minute, Lord. You mean, oh, I, I believe now, now that I've seen you. I, I believe now. Nope. No. It's appointed unto a man, in the book of Hebrews, once to die and after that to face the judgment. Friends, I tell you this with all the sincerity and love in my heart. I don't want to see any of you perish apart from God. I would implore you with tears to receive the Lord while there's still time. He loves you. And though you have rejected him a thousand times, you come to him believing, acknowledging that you're a sinner, recognizing that he died on the cross for your sins. He gave you the free gift of eternal life. If you reach out to him and ask him to save you and put your trust in what he did for you, he will forgive you and he will save you, though you rejected him a thousand times. That is how good and how gracious he is. Amen? Amen. I want to invite the worship band up as we wrap this up here this morning. Don't continue in a state of rebellion against God. Don't continue to be the soil that fell along the path. but rather be reconciled to God. He has a wonderful future for you. He can use you in so many amazing ways. And he alone has the power to save you to the uttermost, the scripture says. That's a wonderful truth. Now next week when we come together, we're going to take a look at the last three soils. We're going to sort of finish off, I mean, our parable. But I'll leave you with a thought as we, uh, as we go to worship. What type of soil are you? What type of soil are you?
if you guys would all stand up with us, and we're going to finish with our last song, I'd Rather Have Jesus. I'd just like to say a big thank you to the band over here. Um, he is always so willing to step up and pick up slack when we need someone to. And with that, you guys can go in peace.